Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. Since time immemorial, humans have conjured up images of gigantic and powerful serpents that lurk in the deep ocean. Giant aquatic snakes appear in the mythologies of many different cultures, including ancient Mesopotamia, India, and Scandinavia. Although these sea serpents are most often associated with myth and legend, in the 19th century they achieved a margin of scientific legitimacy that they have never had either before or since, capturing the imagination of a public trying to make sense of the vast new developments in science. The Victorian era saw an explosion of interest in the mysteries of nature in both the United States and Europe. This was the dawn of a period when legend met science, with the conception that science could easily solve these ancient mysteries. Such concerns are accurately portrayed in Sarah Perry's 2016 gothic romance novel The Essex Serpent and its recent TV adaptation. The discovery of fossils, particularly prehistoric marine reptiles, provided tangible evidence for the existence of creatures which had been regarded as belonging to the realm of the fantastic. As paleontologists discovered and named the plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs, a dramatic increase in sightings of sea serpents also occurred. As Americans and Europeans of the 19th century considered scientific approaches to these mystery animals, they still carried many older ideas that coloured their observations and reactions. From early times, sea serpents were seen as monsters that could attack ships and eat sailors. In Europe, stories concerning these creatures were commonplace in Scandinavia, particularly in Norway. The 16th century Swedish ecclesiastic Olaus Magnus gave the following description of a Norwegian sea serpent in his 1555 work, History of the Northern Peoples. Those who sail up along the coast of Norway to trade or to fish all tell the remarkable story of how a serpent of fearsome size, from 200 feet to 400 feet long and 20 feet wide, resides in rifts and caves outside Bergen. On bright summer nights, this serpent leaves the caves to eat calves, lambs, and pigs, or it fares out to sea and feeds on sea nettles, crabs, and similar marine animals. It has L-long hair hanging from its neck, sharp black scales, and flaming red eyes. It attacks vessels, grabs and swallows people, as it lifts itself up like a column from the water. Magnus is also well known for producing the Carta Marina, a detailed map of Scandinavia and the surrounding ocean. The waters of the North Sea are depicted as being home to many marine monsters, including a large red sea serpent shown attacking a ship. Such depictions were given validation by the accounts of sailors and fishermen, although these would largely be regarded as tall tales until the development of paleontology as a science and the increasing distribution of newspapers and periodicals during the early 19th century. Drawings and news reports by people who did not observe a purported sighting directly could further influence observations and ideas about mysterious creatures of the sea. Beginning with a sighting of the Gloucester, Massachusetts Sea Serpent in August 1817, the idea arose that there was a sea serpent found along the Atlantic coast of North America. Gloucester legends had told of a strange marine creature off the coast since colonial times. An 1817 report of the Linnaean Society of Massachusetts summarised interviews with people who had seen it, including sightings from previous years. They proposed that it was a new species, Scoliophis atlanticus, in a move that was surprisingly common among naturalists at the time. Like some modern cryptozoology enthusiasts, merely seeing a fleeting glimpse of a mystery animal was seen as being enough to warrant an official scientific name. The Gloucester serpent was said to be a dark, sinuous animal that moved vertically up and down in the water like a caterpillar. But actual reports of observers varied a great deal. Witnesses on the shore said it resembled a long line of barrels riding high in the water. Those who saw it from ships reported a dark-coloured snake with a head like a horse. Captain Joseph Woodward of the schooner Adamant reported an encounter off the coast of Cape Anne in May 1818. He said he shot a cannon at the monster. He was quoted as saying that after the cannon shot, the serpent shook its head and its tail in an extraordinary manner and advanced towards the ship with open jaws. I had caused the cannon to be reloaded, but he had come so near that all the crew were seized with terror and we thought only of getting out of his way. 
he almost touched the vessel, and had I not tacked as I did, he would certainly have come on board. He dived, but in a moment we saw him come up again with his head on the other side of the vessel, and his tail on the other, as if he were going to lift up and upset us. However, we did not feel any shock. He remained five hours near us, only going backward and forward. Part of the excitement concerning monsters of the sea was the conception that science could now explain what had once been myth and legend. This points to a contradiction at the heart of Victorian era culture, highlighting the fact that this most pragmatic age was also a time of doubtfulness and dissatisfaction, of fairies, spiritualism and the denial of science. We might also say that it was an age of the imagination, when science was cancelling many of the more irrational beliefs, but left plenty of room for speculation about the nature of the natural world. Many attempts were made to explain the Gloucester Serpent as a group of migrating whales or seals. Some people proposed that an animal thought to be extinct might still be alive, such as the long-necked plesiosaurs. People of the time assumed that there was just one great American sea serpent, but it is quite possible that the variety in the descriptions means that there was not just one animal or group of animals, but various accounts of different creatures or other natural phenomena. The other underlying assumption common to many sea serpent stories of this period, which is also found in Captain Woodward's account, is that it was necessary to try and kill the animal. The concept of sea serpents as creatures that would attack boats and kill sailors continued to colour people's perceptions. On the evening of August the 6th, 1848, a sighting of great importance to the modern history and lore of sea serpents occurred. The crew of the HMS Daedalus observed an enormous fish that was described by the crew as swimming past the boat with its head four feet out of the water while off the coast of Africa, south of St. Helena Island in the South Atlantic. According to Captain Peter McQuay, an enormous serpent, with head and shoulders kept about four feet constantly above the surface of the sea, and, by comparing to the length of the ship, at the very least 60 feet in length. The diameter of the serpent was about 15 or 16 inches behind the head, which was, without doubt, that of a snake. And it was never, during the 20 minutes it continued in sight of our glasses, once below the surface of the water, its colour dark brown, and yellowish white around the throat. It had no fins, but something like the mane of a horse, or rather like a bunch of seaweed washed about its back. This account occurs throughout the serpent literature, and on first glance seems impressive. McQuay's tone is cool and authoritative, and he bolsters his report's validity by mentioning other witnesses by name, by using a series of measurements, and by insisting that the animal was close enough to recognise its features with the naked eye. The sighting caused a sensation among the public, and its impact was heightened by impressive illustrations drawn by an unknown artist, which shows the serpent as a vast creature, as much a gigantic eel as a snake. A drawing made for British newspapers showed a giant snake with a round head and no mane, but this became the image most widely associated with this sighting, even though the artist never saw the animal himself. At the time, a common scientific explanation was that this was a seal or sea lion mistaken for a snake. Some proposed that it was a long-necked seal of an unknown species. Others proposed that it was a plesiosaur that had failed to go extinct, although there were scientists who quickly tried to dismiss this idea. These conceptions, based on an inaccurate drawing, have entered folklore and cryptozoology. Other theories of the Daedalus sighting, based on eyewitness accounts, are that it was some species of baleen whale, and the snake head was actually the top of the animal's mouth. This is plausible if the report of the mane is discarded. In 2015, evolutionary biologist Gary J. Galbraith contended that what the crew of the Daedalus saw was a skim-feeding say whale, instead of a monstrous unknown reptile. Even at the time, there were sceptics who noted the inconsistencies in the captain's description, and these are just as obvious to modern readers. How could it be, for example, that McQuay could estimate the size of the neck to be 15 or 16 inches in diameter, but not be able to see if the mane were real or seaweed? And if he could not make out that detail, how could he be sure that it lacked fins, or insist on the creature's head being four feet out of the water? Viewed in these terms, his apparent objectivity collapses into the subjective, and its ambiguity was interrogated by professional zoologists and geologists. 
The captain's account was dismissed by Sir Richard Owen, the foremost paleontologist of the time. Writing in the Times, Owen suggested that McQuay had seen a large elephant seal, and went on to suggest that proof of ghosts was more convincing than evidence of marine monsters. Others were less certain. Geologist Charles Lyell was initially swayed by the many American sightings, but following his inspection of a bogus skeleton displayed by a certain Mr. Koch in Boston in 1845, decided that it was all nonsense. This was the famous Hydrakos hoax, wherein showman and charlatan Albert Koch assembled the bones of six specimens of the archaic cetacean Basilosaurus into an enormous fake leviathan. Of course, the public were charged to see the so-called Lord of the Ocean, with Koch making a pretty penny out of the sea serpent mania of the time. In January 1860, yet another face was given to the sea serpent, as an astonishing animal washed up on Hungry Beach in Bermuda. It was drawn by an observer, W.D. Munro, and so the artist's rendition of his sketch was likely truer to life than that of the Daedalus sighting. It is, in fact, a recognisable species, the giant oarfish. Even today, news stories about encounters with giant oarfish often call them the real sea serpents. Unlike most fish, they do not have scales. Their dorsal fin and sensory organs that spring as hair-like filaments from the head are bright red in colour. Two red oar-shaped structures also grow from its pectoral muscles, giving it its name. It is thought to be the longest of all bony fish, with well-documented specimens being about 30 feet long, with some longer unsubstantiated individuals also reported. Historic sightings of sea serpents with manes might well have been sightings of this unusual fish. They are deep water animals of warm seas, and are rarely sighted except when they are dead or dying. In 1897, one was captured alive off the coast of Australia and sent to a German aquarium. Strandings like this, as well as half-glimpsed sightings of whales or basking sharks, provided some comfort to sceptical scientists like Richard Owen. Nevertheless, the sea serpent controversy unsettled the scientific community. It postulated the existence of animals that had somehow left no evidence in the fossil record, while suggesting that a completely unknown species, unlike anything else that currently existed at the time, could still be alive. The sea serpent was a challenge, an animal that was incompatible with the prevailing views of world history at the time. Defenders of the veracity of these sightings pointed to the fact that these creatures could be living representatives of ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, or extinct crocodilians. The fact that each of these very different groups could somehow fit the bill is revealing of the sheer lack of hard information and physical remains. Clearly, seeing an ancient marine reptile in a wave or mass of seaweed was a prime example of pareidolia, of identifying shapes in amorphous phenomena. In addition, 19th century accounts in print media reveal the entertainment aspect of news about sea serpents. In a time before television, these stories were often written so that it could be read out loud, and the narrative of sightings often resembled adventure stories. Due to this cultural ubiquitousness, it is no wonder that people began to see these mystery reptiles in the movement of the tides and rolling waves. Although nowhere near as popular today, Elements of the sea serpent craze persist in cryptozoological approaches to lake monsters, such as Nessie and Ogopogo, and to fit a similar function to their serpentine predecessors. In conclusion, sea serpents existed in a liminal space in the 19th century imagination, being placed alongside ghosts and fairies in a romantic niche between legend and science. Never proved, never caught, and all too obviously not real, the fantasy sea serpent was important, in other words, not as a tangible animal, but as a potent symbol of a Victorian longing for mystery in a world increasingly defined by facts, figures, and materialism. Thanks for watching, everyone. The next episode will focus on the razor-toothed hyenodonts. So until then, I'll see you again soon. Cheerio.